crystals a booksome space vixen. Fox McCloud has robot legs. Falco Lombardi is a falcon. The Star Fox team has defeated Andros numerous times. Wolf O'Donnell is an obsessive older guy in leather pants. Okay, last one is supported by Canon. But which of these statements are not like the other? Star Fox is a video game series spanning nine games in three decades of Nintendo hardware. Its colorful anthro animal heroes pilot their R-Wing space fighters to victory against impossible odds. As an in-house Nintendo property, the games hail from Japan and Fox McCloud is a classic shonen anime hero. Skilled, disciplined, selfless, valuing familial honor, and for some reason, piloting the galaxy's most expensive military vehicles as a teenager. Yeah, he's 18 at the first game, can you believe it? But what we're interested in today is how the game's fans override its canon in consistent and even subconscious ways. Falco Lombardi is a falcon who lusts after his team leader in my mind is culturally apt. All fandoms extrapolate from canon, There's simply not enough canon material to satisfy our endless desire for more content. The Star Fox fandom is an odd example though. In Star Fox fanworks, it's not only acceptable to change the characters from their fandom forms, it's almost required. Let's start with an easy one, Crystal's body. Here's what she looks like in the game. She's basically built like a figure skater. Small bust, fairly narrow hips, low body fat, long legs, toned muscles, Sure, not everybody in real life is built like an Olympic athlete, but Falco and Fox are similarly slender and athletic. Now let's take a look at how she's presented in fan art. Hello! <laughs> Crystal is almost universally drawn as having large breasts, an hourglass waist, and hips that may or may not fit into a fighter cockpit. Talk about an unrealistic beauty standard for foxes. On-model drawings of her are so rare that if you ask the average furry to describe Crystal's body type, they're probably going to describe a silicone centerfold rather than a WNBA point guard, even though most furries have seen the game footage where she's not built this way. Part of this is no doubt due to artists accentuating certain parts of her anatomy to titillate viewers, but it doesn't register as a departure from canon to viewers. The question on our minds is why? One clue we're given is how the fan art has changed over time. Fan art that dates from around the time of 2003 Star Fox Adventures presents Crystal as far closer to the original in-game model. Over time in the fan art, her body type shifts from athletic space huntress to straight up playboy vixen. One possible explanation for this is artists referencing each other's work rather than the game's art. But that happens with other games, too. Artists sometimes give Cortana from Halo or Tali from Mass Effect a Dolly Parton figure, but it never really sticks. If you ask a random furry at a convention what Renamon looked like in-universe, large breasts wouldn't make that list, even if the character is drawn that way sometimes. Similarly, the fandom tends to portray Crystal as pouncing on anything that moves. While one of several possible timelines in Star Fox Command sees her dating Panther, she never so much as flirts with anyone but Fox. A few factors likely contribute to her perceived promiscuity. Wearing revealing clothing, dealing confidently with male characters, and being the only female in the setting all play a role. A woman should be able to dress, speak, and work any way she likes, but traditional cultural norms insist that these traits mean she's a fluffy blue floozy. Nintendo also does her no favors in this regard, using her as a PG-rated icon. This isn't to say that Falco doesn't also get posed in a weirdly seductive way by the company. However, Nintendo hasn't been completely oblivious to including more female characters in a departure from the 80s cartoon token female mentality. In various incarnations of the series, they've implemented the four-man band with four different female pilots. Crystal, Farrah Phoenix the Fennec, Miu the Lynx, and Faye the Dog. Farrah Phoenix is Fox's love interest from the Nintendo Power comics. She's an ace pilot, and Fox is equal. She also looks enough like Fox's dead mother to fool people who actually knew her. And Farah happens to fit perfectly in that dress of Fox's dead mother that he keeps on display in his bedroom. 
Yeah, gross. We've been talking a lot about the Japanese comics, but there's also an official comic from the German release. Check this out. Here's a really cool panel from it. Translation is, I hate Kraken. Cool. Falco then wants to eat the Kraken, but it's actually a spaceship. And just in case you thought that the Japanese manga was weird too. Anyways, let's look at another example of a non-canon trait sticking in Star Fox. The team having robotic legs. Since the release of the original game in 1994, fans have speculated whether the team in the original Super Nintendo game had prosthetic legs. The Nintendo Power comics for the SNES version seem to hint at it. In May 2015, the game theorists gave a boost to this theory with a video that explained how real-life G-forces can force blood into the legs and away from the brain, which can cause pilots to black out. MatPat theorizes that Star Fox members amputate their legs to mitigate this danger. Tons of fan art show the Star Fox team with metal legs. It's a really compelling theory, having some science behind it. It's emotionally satisfying too, since it speaks to the extreme selflessness and dedication of the team. It just has one problem. It's not true. It's not true. Every game in the series from the Nintendo 64 reboot onward shows the team wearing what appears to be large boots. Can't you just take my word for it that I don't have robotic legs? In real life, prosthetic limbs tend to be much slimmer than the ones your mom made for you back in the day. These outer space ski boots have plenty of room for a flesh and blood leg. Strangely, in the official Nintendo Power comics, it's not just the Star Fox team who have metal legs. It's every man, woman, and even child in the Lilat system. Even on backwater planets, random villagers have metal legs. The game's creator, Shigeru Miyamoto, himself Self has shot down the metal leg theory. It's purely a design choice uh, because we had to figure out, well, he's a fox and we have these scenes where he's running, but is he running on you know, the curved leg of a fox yeah. or on four legs? Or it was really just a design choice. Furthermore, he points out that fox also has a flesh and blood tail. And that would certainly have the same blood flow problems as legs. The games, meanwhile, make constant mention of G-Diffuser technology. G-Diffuser set to max. Something's wrong with the G-Diffuser. Check your G-Diffuser system. Which cancels out G-Forces during those sweet, sweet aileron rolls. And yet, it remains a secret handshake among the Star Fox fan to know the team all have metal legs. The idea of Star Fox having metal legs is so deeply ingrained in the fandom that works adhering to the canon feel compelled to hang a lampshade on that. In the Star Fox canon, the R-Wings and their G-Diffuser technology were in use years before Fox McCloud ever climbed into the cockpit, having been used by his father. So there'd be no reason for him to have his legs removed. Yet the team is routinely depicted with them in fan art and fiction. They're 100% stock. Yeah, I guess so. An interesting exception here is that Star Fox fans rarely, if ever, give Crystal prosthetic legs. Perhaps because she's the only member on the team, male or female, whom we've ever seen bare-legged. Star Wolf is likewise not depicted with robotic legs, either in fan art or canon art, in spite of being obvious cyborgs in some appearances. So did the team ever have robotic legs? The fascinating reality is that Shigeru Miyamoto designed the original Star Fox box art to look like the 1964 British puppet show Thunderbirds. We liked the, the story, but we also liked the way that they depicted um, sort of those sci-fi ships and things like that, and the miniatures and the puppets. Yeah. And so when we first created the original Star Fox game, my, my real hope was that maybe the BBC would say, hey, we want to do a Star Fox program with puppets. <laughs> That'd be really cool. A closer look at the original box art shows the large heads, jumpsuits, and simple hinge joint limbs of a poseable puppet. In 1993, when the game was first released, 3D computer rendering was in its infancy. The options available for a high detail promotional image were paintings or photographs of physical models. And clearly Miyamoto opted for physical models. I mean, what can I say? This guy clearly has a thing for puppets. As we can see in this promotional image, the Thunderbird style Star Fox puppets have simple hinges for ankles. Human beings don't emote very much with their ankles. So the creators of both the Thunderbirds and Star Fox puppets didn't bother to make them very articulate. 
making the character's anthro prove to also be a smart move for Nintendo, since anthro animals don't evoke the same uncanny valley reaction in viewers as human puppets. Ugh. So why do we like the idea of our heroes having robotic legs? Like most urban legends, it persists because it's a good story. It adds to the narrative of selfless heroes, they've given up everything, even their own bodies protect others. Likewise, the conventional wisdom is that Andros just won't stay dead. This is a recurring gag in Star Fox parodies and a running joke in the community. In the games, though, the team has fought at most twice in any of the continuities. In the longest storyline, they defeat him at the end of Star Fox 64 and when he magically appears at the end of Star Fox Adventures. In the Super Nintendo game and comics, they similarly defeat him once in the game and again in the comics. The new Star Fox Zero timeline has you defeat him once. A player could be forgiven for forgetting this. Between the two series reboots and the game sometimes making you beat him more than once to see different content or inherent James McCloud's aviator sunglasses. As with Star Wars, it's best not to think too hard about the character names in the Star Fox universe. Sure, Fox is a fox, a panther is a panther, wolf is a wolf, Falco is a pheasant. Takaya Imamura, a dev on the original game, drew upon Japanese folklore for the team. Talking pheasants appear in various tales, such as Momotaru. This is backed up by falcons not being blue, while Japanese pheasants are. The fandom also has some more expected instances of overriding canon. For example, Falco Lombardi gets shipped with Fox far more than his canon love interest, Cat Monroe. Let me get a piece of that action, Fox! Part of this is the usual internet tendency to ship pretty male characters together, especially when they have a lot of interactions together on screen. But it also arises from an interesting scene in the official Nintendo comic Farewell, Beloved Falco, where he is talking to Cat about why he's not dating anyone. In the original Japanese version, Falco specifically avoids saying what gender his lover would be. The ambiguous wording can be interpreted as Falco being bisexual or possibly disinterested in relationships, though it's very possible he's just playing coy in front of Cat. Falco shows no particular romantic interest in Fox, however. For all his bluster, Falco is pretty progressive as a male character. His relationship with Cat is the only cross-species relationship in the game. Moreover, they are presented as equals in most Star Fox media. He even lowers his shields, expressing empathy of the devastation he sees when even Fox remains stoic. Furthermore, Falco is a helpful example of a type of bisexual we rarely get to see. In media, bisexuals are often portrayed as disinterested in committed relationships. Just as they are too horny for just one gender, they are too horny for just one partner. Everybody's favorite bisexual birdie is quite the opposite, however. If he's interested in anybody, the games insist it's his longtime friend. This all might seem minor, but we often build our identities from what we see as possible for fictional characters. Far weirder than shipping Falco and Fox, the internet has decided that Wolf O'Donnell and Fox McCloud need to bang. I thought I blamed a giant space head for my father's death, but now I think I blame myself. I can't let you do that, Star Fox. As far as we've seen in any official media, Wolf and Fox have never even been in the same room. Their every interaction has been from the cockpit of a fighter, and they're usually trying to kill each other. The only exceptions come when a more dangerous enemy forces them to team up. So, what's the story here? Put simply, in canon, Wolf O'Donnell seeks to dominate McCloud against his will, and through any means necessary. Wolves prey on foxes, after all. On a furry trivia note, Wolf personally contributes another misconception to the fandom. He's the only one in the canon who refers to McCloud as Star Fox. Everyone else uses that as the name of that whole team. Plenty of novice fans, however, have followed suit. And yes, granted Wolf is obsessed with proving himself against Fox, which is not an uncommon motivation in Japanese media. Plus, the English translations have some interesting lines of dialogue. And furries find a gray muzzle, a leather daddy, appealing. So we tend to ignore that Wolf frequently taunts Fox about killing his father. I wasn't, uh, I, I was he was just, just showing, showing him my whoa, 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 hey, hey, I uh, fully support whatever this is. I don't judge. So we return to our big question. Why does Star Fox fan and not just fill in the gaps of 
but overwrite official Star Fox canon. One factor is the Anthro characters themselves, as the series lands well within the bounds of the furry fandom. Furries, unlike conventional fandoms centered around just one property, revel in creating our own. This fandom overwrite isn't strictly a bad thing. The furry fandom is, essentially, one giant creative exercise, and naturally its love of Star Fox takes the form of a remix. Exploring and transforming works we connect with can be a great avenue for better understanding ourselves. The lesson here is reality is tough to lock onto, especially on the internet. We all have to be vigilant to not accept rumor or common sense as fact. Think for yourself and verify with reliable sources. Outside of Furry, the one instance that comes to mind is Star Trek's Beam Me Up, Scotty, which is never said by Kirk verbatim, yet has been associated with the show since its earliest days. This, however, is not nearly as extensive as the overwriting we've seen in Star Fox. What do you think? Do other canons get overwritten by their fans the way Star Fox does? Let us know down in the comments. Shout out to Tempo for writing this week's episode of Culturally Effed. Tempo is the author of Six is Wild and Windfall, two award-winning furry novels you can find links to in the description. Previews and fan work can also be found on his fur affinity. Also, be sure to check out our brand new rewards on Patreon, like some custom artwork, your character here thumbnails by me, Underbite, or get Rusty to say anything you want him to say. I've been your host, Underbite. Thanks for watching.